My name is Paul Schreiber. Um, I'm a, one of many former Tandy employees. Um, so uh, thanks to Peter for inviting me. He tried to get me to come last year, and I chickened out, but I decided to come this year. And so, go ahead, go on, just started. So what I'm gonna talk about is, uh, I was trying to figure out exactly what to talk about. So I'm gonna talk about the last part of when I was at Tandy R&D, which is pre-AST and when AST bought Tandy. Some of you might not remember when AST bought Tandy, but they did. So I'm going to run through these slides, and then I'll have a Q&A at the end. You'll probably have a lot of questions. Um, so this is just going to be just a little small portion of the things that we did at Tandy, and uh, hope you enjoy it. So again, I'm going to focus on 1990 to 1993, mainly, maybe a few years before that. But if you have any questions, I started working at Tandy in 1977. I was Steve Leiniger's technician, and I wire wrapped the Model 1 prototype. So that's how far back I go. Um, but my main purpose of doing this today is to give some names to faces. Okay, A lot of people know Steve Leiniger, but that's all they know. And I think that's unfair because there was a lot of people who put in a lot of hard work at Tandy R&D that no one knows who was, they were. And that's also true at companies like Apple. You go name five people at Apple. They go, Waz, Jobs, that Ivy guy that left, and I don't know. Name 11 people at Microsoft. Gates, Balmer, he's crazy, and maybe some other guy, John Shirley. That's it. So my point is to say, there's a lot of people who spend a lot of hours there, and, I'm gonna sh and I've tried to find some pictures. It's hard because cameras were not allowed in our building, so we couldn't, I don't have a lot of, you know, sh shots of Tandy R&D itself. So just think of how your individual workbenches are and put that into five buildings, and that's probably what it kind of looked like. And then, of course, blaming everybody but me for the failure because people say, what went wrong? It's everybody's fault but me. Some Q and A. <laughs> now you're going to have to use your imagination. That that was me in 1980, the year I started Tandy R and D. Yes, I was handsome. I weighed 147 pounds at a 28 inch waist. You know, uh, David, where was this taken? Mama's Pizza. Okay. So I started in 1977. This is kind of strange because when I turn my head, you can't hear me. So I started in 1977. Can you still hear me? Okay. Okay. So I co-op there. So a co-op is what a fancy name for an engineering intern. So a co-op is paid. Intern is not paid. So I got paid minimum wage, two dollars and seventy-five cents an hour, to work at Tandy R&D, and I was a technician. And the first time I worked there was uh, from January to May of 1977, and I was there specifically to do TV games, like the old Pong game. And so we had a Kepro etcher with the ferric chloride, and I would stick my hands in there. OSHA, Tandy, ha <laughs> ha, what does that even mean? Okay, and I was etching boards for the TV games that we were doing for Pong. And then towards the end of that, Steve Leiniger emerged, and I'll tell you about Steve Leiniger here in a second. He emerged from a secret location. So I didn't want anybody to know about it. He was sequestered, as we say in the jury world. He was sequestered, but he came to Tandy R&D, and then I was his technician. So I would sit there and wire wrap stuff for him and got things working. So then I had to go back to school. Oh, I also did this project. Anybody make those little red project box things? Okay, I designed about 20% of those. When I was, I was a co-op, I'd taken two double E classes, I was a chemistry major, and I was like, you're, you're qualified, okay. <laughs> so I did that, also this thing called the Reverb Project Board, okay, I did that too. Yeah, this is a big store in Germany, sold 50,000 of those in Germany. I don't know why, Germans. Schreiber, okay. <laughs> then I went back to school, I came back in the fall, and that's when they started doing the Model 1 factory. And I was a factory repair tech. I sat at a bench, 
bench, Tandy bench, with a scope and a Radio Shack voltmeter, and I had to fix 50 boards a day. They wouldn't let me go home. So that's a whole other slideshow about those days. 50 boards a day. So I graduated uh, from Texas A&M in 1979. I went into 74, so I crammed a four-year program into five years. I mentioned I was a chemistry major when I went in, so I was a double E coming out. So I took a little extra time. Had a disagreement with a professor over a grade. You know, stuff like that. So when I came back, I was hired specifically to do the modem one. Anybody here have a modem, modem one? So that's why they hired me. They said, we need someone to do modem one. So I was working at the time at Data General. Data General had uh, laid everybody off because they sold our building to the University of Texas. And so I called up my old boss at Tandy, and I said, uh, you need anybody to work up there? He goes, why are they paying you? And I said, okay. I was getting $18,600, this time for a raise. I said, they're paying me nineteen two. He goes, bullshit, they're paying you about eighteen five. I'll pay you eighteen five. And I said, okay. <laughs> so I took, I took a $100 pay cut to go up back up to Tandy. And I went up to Tandy and I walked in just like I'd never left. It was the same people and I just sat down and I started working. On the first day, they go, you're in charge of modems. I said, great, what's a modem? Okay, you know. <laughs> so I worked on that. And so I was there for four years from May of 80 to 84. I started on modems. Uh, I became, I was kind of always a, an audiophile hobbyist guy, so I did a lot of audio, audio work. Worked on car, car stereos. And then I, a lot of people know me like Ian for my graphics cards stuff. Um, then I left because of pay. Tandy was not high paying. Raise your hand if you're shocked that Tandy was not high paying. So I actually doubled my salary by going to work for a telecommunications company. So I left and then they got bought out twice and laid everybody off. This is a recurring theme in my career, by the way. If you have children here and you say, you need to be like Paul Schreiber, I'm like, eh, 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 eh. okay, go, go get a stable job, okay? Like a pinball repair guy or something. But I came back again, so I made the same phone call to the same guy and I said, hey, you need anybody to hire anything? He goes, you got laid off again? I go, yeah, okay. So I went back in May of 1988, and as you see here, I worked on things which all went very badly, but it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It's just a coincidence they all went badly. Marketing. Marketing. David Frager. All right, so let's start talking about some people. This is Steve Leininger. This is probably the best picture of him. Um, he's still alive. He's in Colorado. He's a Catholic uh, minister for the homeless in Colorado. And so that's a little different turn, you would suspect. But the thing I was impressed was uh, people talk about how smart Waz was. Steve Loniger is one of the smartest people I've ever met. He got a master's in double E from Purdue with a 4.0 when he was 19 years old. Let that sink in. When I was 19 years old, I was like, is this a resistor? <laughs> okay. That's a chemistry. So he did 100% of the hardware on the Model 1. So where was Steve Leininger sequestered while he developed the Model 1? Anybody know? The lore? He was in a custodial closet at our speaker factory. So Tandy at the time was the world's largest producer of speakers. They were in every Ford. Every Ford car you bought in the 60s and the 70s had Tandy speakers in them. Half of the Pioneer speakers you bought were from Tandy's factory. So we were an OEM. We didn't just make Radio Shack speakers, we made speakers. And they had a janitorial closet and they stuck him in there to hide him. But you know what's interesting about janitorial closets? They don't tend to have air conditioning in them. So he got so hot, he had to leave. And so we put him over at Tandy R&D, which by the way, was in an old tire store. It's another story. So here's some people that, uh, we're part of uh, management. So this is Dr. John Patterson. He was the VP of Tandy R&D, recently passed away. He was a professor of, of uh, communication theory at University of Texas at Arlington. And the reason that we hired him was because he has the word doctor in front of his name. So the person I kept calling over and over again to ask for a job is a guy named Chris Klein. He recently died last year. He uh, was in charge of everything but computers. So 
That's who I officially worked for. I was not in the computer division. I was in the consumer division, but I was a floater. So whenever somebody needed help in the computer division, usually analog power supply, and I was the graphics guy, I got stuck over there for a while, but then I got pulled back. So I could work on the Model 2000 joystick TV adapter one day and work on Blau Blaupunk car stereos the next day. Sort of a thing. The, di the director, so these are director levels. The director of the computer side is a guy named Bill Wilson. They're on the left. I'm just not gonna talk about this picture because I'll probably have to be carried away if I talk too much about that picture. Let's just say that no one in that picture knows any idea what they're pointing at. <laughs> Who remembers the show Murphy Brown? So what was the little shtick about Murphy Brown? Every week she had a what? That was our secretary number 43. And she's like, I hope I'm pointing right. All right, so this is the best picture I could find of what we all look like back when we were actually doing all the stuff that you guys like to collect. So softball, was what we did at Tandy socially, okay? We had a very highly organized, highly competitive softball league that was the social event of the year for, for, for all of Tandy and Radio Shack. We're talking thousands of people participating. And this team that was on for Tandy R&D, not only did we got second place, we never won the softball tournament because it was one team that always beat us because they had a minor league player that could like hit the softball 600 feet, you know. So we never beat that team, but we always got second. But we did win the city of Fort Worth tournament. And so we were the city champions of Fort Worth in this team. So does anybody have a little laser pointer? I saw, I saw one yesterday. Just gonna check. All right, so I'm gonna kind of quickly go through, so, so not all of these people are from TND R&D, but I'm gonna briefly point to them while he's looking. Did you find one? He's looking, I wonder if this thing works. Okay. Stop doing that. Yeah, okay. It worked great the first time I tried. Yeah, the one that says don't look. Okay. All right, so I want to stop here. Okay, the guy with the different shirt, there's always that guy. All right, this guy's name is Paul Pimsel. He currently uh, lives in Austin. And he and I were the two repair technicians at the Model 1 factory. He used to give me a ride. He had a Lotus Europa. It's awesome. And uh, so he worked on something called Thor. If you know what Thor is, I feel sorry for you and for me and for Paul Pimsel. All right, next, we'll skip that guy. This guy here, his name is Mike Grubbs. He did the pocket computer. He was a manager for the Tandy pocket computer. He later uh, worked for a guy named Howard Elias in computer marketing, and then he got to be VP of sales at Gateway, the Cal computer company. Okay, this is Chris Klein. He was, he was my boss there. Okay, this guy here is a good friend of David's. His name is Sam Sawyer. So Sam Sawyer and Mike Berger were the two computer architects for Model 2, Model 16. Those are the two guys that did it, okay? Moving along. God, look at that guy there. Look at that little waist, look at that son. All right, this guy here, he was our ringer on the softball team. He had a softball scholarship from University of Arizona, Skip Curdy. He could throw a softball so hard it made a sound. It kind of went zzz through the air, it was amazing. So he was our mechanical engineer. So he basically designed all the plastics for all the computers you own. Is this guy here? And last but not least, it's not the person you want sitting up here right now, which is me. The person you want, we're gonna to try to get next year is this guy right here. This is Rick Thompson. He was the chief designer of basically every Tandy computer made except the Model 1. Okay, he designed literally everything. He's also a scratch golfer. There's another picture of me and Mama's Pizza. 
But I'm gonna talk about this guy right here. He was my best friend. His name was Brady McMurtry. We were called the Blues Brothers, and our job was to irritate management. <laughs> David, how did we do? Good. All right. <laughs> David even joined in. I have some, so back then the thing was fake memos. So this is before the internet, all right? Before the internet, we had a mailbox behind the reception area with little cubby holes for everybody's mail, right? And so when management wanted to say something, like we're gonna restripe the parking lot or something, they put memos in everybody's box. But they were, shall we say, unsecured. <laughs> All right, when going through my stuff, I found this original schematic that Brady wrote called Color Computer 2 Direct Video Model 590. Was this, a, was this ever a thing? Was it? Well, there's the schematic. You're free to copy it. There you go. So that's one of the things I found in my archives. And by the way, I'll put this up on my website, this PowerPoint, so you can all download it if you want to do that. And it's going to be archived and stuff. But uh, I thought it was interesting. I actually found one of Brady's old schematics. OK. This is back when we used to draw with a thing called a pencil. <laughs> Something called a drafting board using templates. No, it's CAD stuff. Paul, Sir? Did Brady go to college? Huh? Did Brady go to college? The College of the Blues Brothers. Yeah, yeah. I thought he was homegrown. Yeah. Is yeah. Home. Wow. Yeah. yeah. He was a character. All right. So, Brady and I hit it off immediately because we have the same sense of humor. In fact, we didn't even have to talk to each other. When we saw something, we looked at each other and said, okay. So, the first year I was there, Christmas of 1980, I walk up to, the, to my mailbox and right before Christmas, and everybody's got this same piece of paper in there, and it's a little season's greeting from the management that says Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, and." Good job and get back to work. Why are you standing here looking at this piece of paper? <laughs> and so I got out of my mailbox, and the, the secretary at the time, whichever one that was, number 17 or something, had just put them all in so no one had taken them out. So I went back to Brady. I didn't say anything, I just handed it to him. He didn't say anything. He went off and he came back about 10 minutes later. Well, we just put our names here at the bottom with everybody else, okay? <laughs> you know, John Roach, Cornfield, Bernie Appel, you know, Kip Adafiel, blah, 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 John Shirley, blah, blah, Paul Schreiber, Freddie McMurtry. <laughs> so we took all the other ones out, we threw them away, and we put these in. Right? Bill Wilson comes to my office. He lays it down, and of course, he's a man of few words. He looks at me and he goes, not funny. <laughs> Walks away. <laughs> so we did it next year. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna talk about the lead up to my end of my tenure at Tandy R&D. Who remembers the incredible universe? Now, I've used this picture in presentations before, but it wasn't until last night until I noticed there's a guy standing there and he's like, who took my chair? I don't know, probably. So, Incredible universe. So who, who here remembers Consumer Reports? Anybody remember? Consumer Reports was a, a magazine that said, well, we, we tested 57 refrigerators and here's our best one. There was a Radio Shack executive who loved Consumer Reports. And so he wanted to buy a dishwasher. So he got the Consumer Reports. He went to our local Fort Worth appliance store and said, I want this Consumer Reports best dishwasher. He goes, we don't have that model. 
He goes, how can you not have the best one? Turns out that the appliance industry protected their dealers. If you were a top dealer, you got the good models. If you were a little dealer, you didn't get the good models. So not every store had every model. He goes, you know what? We're gonna make one where you can buy every model of every dishwasher ever made, and they did. And that was their whole shtick. You could go into Incredible Universe and say, I want a hot point model 47 digits, and they go, it's right here. It was list price, no discount, list price, but they had it. Fail, $150 million. Not my fault. <laughs> this one was definitely not my fault. Uh, yeah, yeah. The Q tab. <laughs> and I copied this right off the, the Q cat Wikipedia where it says the worst tech product ever. And I went, uh huh. Tandy and Renishek lost $50 million on the Q cat. $50 million on the Q cat. Yes, sir. I don't get it. What is it? All right. Look at its little nose. What do, what do you think that is? It's a barcode reader. So luckily it's not. So you had a cable out of its ass and an LED out of its nose. And you had this. All right. This is how marketing people think sometimes. They go, we, we need a, a hook for the QCAT. So what the QCAT was, was we, we have the Radio Shack flyer that we all got thousands of, and we have these codes in. If you scan the code in your computer, it will print out a 20% off coupon you can take to your store, okay? Then we can track everybody and how many people scanned it and everything. But we need a hook, and they said, and they paid some marketing company like $3 million to come up with like a logo, and they came up with this, and they said, we're gonna slant the barcode at 17.47 degrees. Isn't that cool? Because nobody else slants the barcode, do they? Do they? No. They're up and down. We're slanted. <laughs> Give us $2 million. Well, the thing was, they actually shipped these to millions of people, and the trouble was, it wouldn't work anywhere but on the special code. Of course, they had it where it's like, well, you have to have this mark space at each end. Notice that it, you know, it's not symmetrical. See, bar barcodes are symmetrical. You can scan this way or that way. Not the QCAT. You have to scan this way. All right? So people are like taking their Campbell soup cans and going, what worked? What worked? What worked? Yes, there's mods to make it work. So the whole thing was a disaster. There's a whole good Wikipedia page on it. And the guy who invented it, he makes L. Ron Hubbard look like the Pope. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about that. All right? So when I got to Tandy in 1988, I got laid off from the telecommunication company, not my fault, was they put me on this thing called Project Thor. So Project Thor was probably the most secret project we ever did, even more than Steve Leininger in a closet. We had Project Thor, and Project Thor was gonna be the world's first read-write audio CD player. Of course, you're going, yeah, I've got a whole closet full for like five bucks a piece, but in 1988, nobody had that. In fact, it was not clear if you could even do that. Well, there was a company in California, a bunch of PhD scientists that were dipolymer experts, and they claimed to have a dipolymer method where you could hit it with the laser beam and turn it from light to dark, and that's how you could read a one and a zero. And so they went to Bernie Appel, and they said, Bernie, if you give us a bunch of money, we'll sign over this technology. And Bernie says, I want to see a demo. No. They said, fine. Was I invited to the demo? No. So they took some other people to the demo. The demo was faked. They sold Bernie Appel on a fake demo. Tandy bought the company. They hired a bunch of people. We spent about a year and a half of R&D until I found out it was faked. And then they yelled at me when I said it was faked. Then other people, then they started suing each other and then we lost $30 million. I couldn't even tell you. I couldn't tell you. Um, then, to, then 
Bernie said, we want some digital thing. So back then, there was really only one digital audio format. Who remembers what it was? DAT, D-A-T, DAT tape, digital audio tape. Used eight millimeter, little VCR like a VHS-C thing. Helical scan like a VHS. It was done by JVC, Japanese Victor Corporation. Huh? It's four, four? And uh, it uh, was used in like pro audio studios and things like that. And it was like, you know, that, that recorder players were like 1700 bucks. You know, they were like rack mount things. But Phillips said, you know what? We liked that idea. And we used to have this thing called the L cassette, which was like this giant cassette. So we have all this tooling. So what if we make a digital version ourselves? So they called it DCC, the Digital Compact Cassette. And they said, we're going to record digital data on these L cassettes, nine tracks, those so eight tracks for data and one track for sync clock. The trouble is it used a special silicon, not a magnetic head like a regular tape with magnets and coils. It used a silicon etched head from a company called ReadWrite, who was the world's largest producer of hard drive heads, except it had a 5% yield, which means they made 105 worked. Okay, so I was in charge of doing all the audio design for the DCC. Worked with Sony, worked with Philips, but we never got one working because they would like send us one head in the mail and then work five times and die. And the whole thing just croaked. We lost $15 million on that. So the thing that you need to do when you have really bad products in a row is you immediately start thinking, we need a new building. So that's what they did. So that's the Tandy Technology Center. It's now the Tandy Municipal. If you have to pay a fine, that's where you go in Fort Worth. <laughs> There's some irony in that that escapes me. So this is the Tandy Technology Center. Okay, so I actually have, this is the photo you saw of Bill Wilson pointing to a logic analyzer, thinking to himself, I hope no one notices this is a logic analyzer. It looks like my you know, refrigerator at home. This is uh, the little brochure that you got at the grand opening and actually kept it. I don't know why, but I kept it. So that's the building. It looks pretty nice, doesn't it? You know, you say, it looks kind of nice. <laughs> so this is where engineering went. So engineering was on these three floors. The, the bottom two floors in the basement was actually Tandy IT. They had all their mainframes, like when you wrote your name for your little battery, that's where it went. So they wanted to move the mainframe. So the bottom of this was this big, you know, air conditioned false floor, you know, UPS power supplies, you know, thing. And this was all engineering. So do you think it makes sense when you want to build an engineering building? Now, I'm just thinking out loud here. <laughs> you might want to ask engineers what the building should look like. Does that, does that sound okay to you? Yeah. Like, hey, guys. Engineers are just going to ask for something stupid. Like floor space. Yeah. It's like marketing. Sorry. Right. <laughs> so they said, you know what we need? I'll tell you what we need. We need a fancy room to sit in. And they have presentations to tell other people just how fancy we are. This room, when it was built, what was this, David? Like 1987, 88? But I'd say like, I think, I think it's like 89. This room cost $6 million. Okay? We, th we buy these on eBay for like a hundred bucks, right? It was, they were invented by a company in Canada called Barco. $28,000 for the Barco projector. There were 28,000. See, I even got the amount right. So, ha 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 on that guy. <laughs> $28,000. But where the wedding was spent was not in the chair in the upholstery in the barco. Part of it was spent up here. There's a company in Dallas called AMX, and AMX made this little touchscreen thing that when you touched it, 
the lights dimmed and the curtains drew and they thought that was the greatest thing ever. It's like, look what it does. They sat there all day and like made the lights dim. The AMX system was like half a million dollars, okay? There's like a freaking light dimmer with an X10 controller on it and they go, look what we did, okay? That's not where the money was. The money was in this wall, okay? So anybody wanna guess what's behind that wall? Huh? Good guess, but wrong. What's worse? What could be worse? Now you have to know Tandy Center history. Y'all probably know me. We had our own subway system that went to the parking lot, and right behind there is the subway station where the. Oh my God! Never would have guessed that. And so those walls are 30 inches thick, full of silica sand, to dampen the vibration noise from when the subway comes in. Of course, in the engineering world, our motto we had on t-shirts was, who took my scope probe? Because we're like, we need a new scope probe. I'll oh, just use some coat hangers over there. Like, I don't know, it's like 18 million. All right, so this is a top view looking down. So when I think engineering building, I think Let's put a big frickin' hole right down the middle of it because that's what engineers want. We want a big hole right down the center of our building. Well, the reason there's a hole in the middle of this building called the atrium is because in order to save money, now I just want you to understand that it's very difficult to realize that Radio Shack was cheap. So in order to save money, they didn't go to an architect and say, engineers want a new building, here's what engineers need. They didn't go ask architects to go, have you designed other engineering buildings for other companies and what did they need? They said, what you got cheap? So they had a bank building, set of plans for a bank building that they never paid for because they didn't expend the bank building and we went, perfect. So this is a bank building, and bank buildings like to have atriums because they look pretty for your bank. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about the two projects that I worked on, that I was the lead engineer on, that failed, but it was not my fault. Here's the first one. Who knows what zapping a gazillion zelophons means? Has anybody ever heard that phrase? It was in a TV ad that Radio Shack made for Christmas. Do you want your kids watching TV or playing video games where they could be zapping a gazillion gelophons? No, you don't. Your kids should be reading the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> because this product was thought of by Another brilliant person who said, you know, I love my Encyclopedia Britannicas, and my kids love those, but what if they were like multimedia? That would be great. They don't need to be playing Doom or Space Invaders or zapping a gazillion zelophons. They need to be edumacated. So let's do this little project right here, the VIS. If the QCAT was number one, here comes the new GOAT. What, is, what does GOAT mean? Greatest of, Greatest of all time. The VIS, the Video Information System. So the idea was, we're going to put this in your house, and it's not gonna play games, it's gonna educate your children with all this interactive multimedia content. That sounds like not a bad thing, really. Because really games weren't that big. We didn't have graphics cards back then and everything was plugged to your TV set. And so this sounds in theory like it should be okay, right? It's not that bad. I'm getting there. So here's some more people. So it had an infrared remote controller, not Wi-Fi, it wasn't invented, it was infrared. So I hired a guy from New Mexico State named Steve Erickson, who was hired to do the infrared remote controller. And it was the only, I only got to hire two people the whole time I was at Tandy. And this is back when you got fax resumes. And I put out very specific 
uh, classified ads in the trade magazines, and I got over 3,000 resumes. And my first thing was to go through them was, did you even read the ad? And I got rid of 90% of them, because they were like, I saw your ad, but I thought you might, but, so here I am, but. And I went, nope. So I found this guy's resume, and he said, I just graduated, and I would love to come work there. And he came, and, I, and when I interviewed, I said, tell me what you've done. And he reached into his little briefcase, and he pulled out with him a senior design project, which, which was a MIPS computer wire wrapped. And I said, that's all I want to see, you're hired. And I know how to pick him, because after he left VIS, he became the senior vice president of Worldwide Sales for Creative Labs, retired at age 47, worth $100 million. So there you go. I can pick them. The other person I got to pick is a friend of David Frager's. Oh, not second person. This is Frank. I, forgot, I put Frank in last night, sorry. So Frank Durda, who none of you know, recently passed away and had to hoard and I'm trying to dehoard the hoarder. He's such a bad hoarder that when the hoarder's TV show went to Frank's house, they went, you're too over the top, you know. So like I was the floater engineer at Tandy R&D where I floated between analog and digital, between the computers and the consumer. Frank was my equivalent in software. Frank was not assigned to any software project. He just walked around and said, what's broken, what's broken? And software, that was every day, every cube, what's broken, what's broken? And so Frank was in charge of our VAX. We bought a, a VAX 11780. Was it brand new, fresh from the deck? No, we found it like on the side of the road and Frank had to fix it. You know, he fixed LDOS, and his main job in VIS was to go between Steve Ballmer and Tandy. Because this was Steve Ballmer, who was the senior VP, second in command behind Bill Gates. He wanted to really push VIS. So he thought it was a good idea, too. So the Radio Shack guy and Steve Ballmer thought it was a great idea. It was just my problem to, like, just make it work. So here's a few of the 1,183 reasons that it failed. All right, so we had another engineer named Dale Chatham. He was a project manager. He was also the project manager for all the color computers. He was John Prickett's boss, for example. Okay, Dale's off the grid. I can't find a picture of Dale, but you just have to believe me. He made this big gamble. He gambled that Intel would drop the price of a 16 megahertz 286 from the time we put the number in the bomb to sell the Radio Shack till we actually bought it. He said, well, it's going to be like 10 months from now. Certainly Intel will drop the price. No, Intel raised the price because they wanted people to stop buying it and buy 386 SXs instead. So we had to ship a 12 megahertz 286 in there. Right, because that's all that Intel would, would do. What we should have done is put a 386SX20 in there and told Radio Shack that's the minimal speed you can run. You're going to have to drop your margin. No. What did you say? <laughs> I want you to say that again real slow and clearly because we're going to record this. You want us to drop our 63 points of margin? will go broke because Radio Shack treated everything like a skew. It was a battery, it was a blank cassette tape, it was a multi-channel, it, it was a computer, you know. It's a price we buy and a markup we get and here's what we want and here's the corporate target and, and that's not our problem if you can't meet the target, you know. You know what our target is, you know. We had a Lotus 123 spreadsheet that you typed in the Radio Shack retail price and three hours later the bomb price came out, okay, and then that's what you had to sell it for. And was it a penny over, David? Did they buy it if it was a penny over? No. Now, I'm not joking. If it was a penny over, no deal. No deal. So we couldn't say, look, instead of getting, so 63 points of margin is not 63%. Okay, it's like 300%. So instead of like making $500 on it, why don't you make $480 on it and put a 386 SS in it? We'll go broke. All right, so that's the first problem. Now, remember, at the time this shipped, okay, I'll have that the next slide, 
we were shipping computers with 486 SXs in them. All right, so it's not like the 286 was all that was out there. We had all of Intel's processors available to us. But in order to make the price, we had to buy one for like $11 or something, and that's what we got. The most expensive item in there was CD-ROM drives. Now this is in the early days of CD-ROM drives. You know, they were still kind of weird and, and people didn't know, do you use the caddy? Remember the little caddy drives, you know, or do you not use the caddy? And they were arguing over, well, if it's not a caddy, then it's gonna vibrate and fly off in the world and stuff. And so we went to our internal trading division called a and and so a and was our Asian sourcing company, all right? So they handled all the Asian sources, and we said, we want a good, cheap, reliable CD-ROM drive. What word did I leave out? Good, fast. cheap, fast. I left out the word fast. They came in, we got one that has a 1.2 second access time. And I said, no, no, you mean like 120 milliseconds? No. Okay, I want you to go get this track off the drive. <laughs> I said, do they like put a capacitor in the head or something? And that's what they came back with. And I said, I want one with a 350 millisecond drive. It was double the price. Double the price. So because of this, we had this. It took four minutes and 17 seconds to boot up from power. So you're in a home consumer, right? When you turn on your TV, how long does it take to turn it come on? Second? Dishwasher? Toaster oven? Does anything you own in the early 90s take four minutes to come up? If it took more than 30 seconds, you, you started hitting it. Right? It's broken. So we find, tried to figure out what was it. Well, Frank Durda put his logic analyzer on the bus and said, well, Microsoft is calling file open and file close 4,000 times. And I went, what? So then we had this whole thing like Pulp Fiction. What? 4,000, what, what? <laughs> and I, so we go up to Microsoft and we go, why are you doing this 4,000 times? They go, well, there's like 20 people on it and they all F open and F close. And I'm like, so Frank got it down to like 350. Of course, remember system.any? It read that 85 times. And I said, what? What? And he goes, well, they open it, and they read, no, system.ini is a text file, so they would open it, and that programmer would read his line and get his dash one or dash two at the end of some thing, and then pass it to the next programmer. I said, why don't you just read it all into memory one time, and then have a pointer and then just to have the people point from memory. They looked at me like, wow, that's pretty clever. Can, can we patent that or something? Is that, can we, can we patent that? So here's the TV ad where they're zapping a gazillion zillophons, and I showed it because you can't see on the screen, there's a picture of a clown with a gun that says bang on a thing because their whole thing was, your kids could be watching anything on TV, including the clown with the, bull, clown with the gun. So they had a clown with a gun that said bang. By the way, this family was so white, people in Norway said, God, that's a white family. <laughs> so it came out at $6.99 with a comp encyclopedia. It was, okay, so I'm gonna talk about these two words here that David knows between the difference between announced and introduced. So Radio Shack liked to announce things six months before they actually shipped to get buzz in the press. So they announced it in June of 92, but introduced means that was the first one that came out of the factory when you could actually buy it. So it was set up for Christmas of 92. We built 45,000 of them, and Bernie Appel set the sales goal for $25 million for the December sale. And yes, it had a Q code for it which was around at the time nine units per store. So we shipped six to 10 per store. One was the demo unit. We had a little demo 
disks that just ran in the background, and they had five or six units ready to sell. So how many people, raise your hand if you think they exceeded that goal. Raise your hand. <laughs> really? Did I give it away already? How many people think they got within 20% of that goal? How many people think they got not even close to that goal? You win. Let's see how close they got. They sold 1,100 and 200 came back. 1,100. They only missed it by 98%. So they made 45,000. They wound up selling 8,500 total through the home shopping network when they dropped the price to 399. Okay. Sorry, that's my phone. And uh, the rest of them, they wrote off and they literally put them into a crusher and crushed them. The project was canceled on January the 10th. Now remember, we just got back from Christmas on January the 4th. A week later, they canceled the project. It's the fastest project cancellation in the history of Radio Shack and Tandy. All right? It was canceled. They wrote off, and you can check this. It's in the annual report, $75 million. A new record. The very next day, now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. And I'm sure it's a coincidence that the very next day, after Bernie canceled the project, he got rid of Tandy. Because Tandy got spun off as a new company called Tandy Electronics, and we're just going to do our own great thing. And John Roach and Bernie Appel said, go away, just go away. They immediately laid off 10%, canceled everyone's vacation, canceled all capital equipment, froze salaries. Then along comes AST Computers in May of 93, and they bought us for the CPU allocation because back then Intel could only sell CPUs to the top five people. Everybody else was on the dreaded allocation. AST was number six. So the CEO of AST, a guy named Safi, who David reported to at one point, because when he left Tandy, he went to AST, trader. <laughs> Safi goes to Intel and says, what if we buy someone in the top five? So Intel didn't even think that was a possibility. They go, well, okay. So they bought Tandy just to get our Intel allocation. They immediately off 15% and started a rolling series of four layoffs. Hang on, I apologize for that. Almost done. Here's the final nail in the coffin, the Tandy sensation. Anybody here own one? They're kind of rare. That's because most of them didn't work and people threw them away. That's why they're rare. But I was the project lead on both sensations. Still wasn't my fault. <laughs> All right, here's the sensation one motherboard. And what I did is everything over here. This was all my design. This over here is all Rick Thompson and another guy named Johannes Sawataputra, which I'm not gonna spell for you. And it used the Intel 46SX, because when I think multimedia, and I think graphics, and I think high speed, I think, why do I need a mathematical processor for? We'll put it in a socket. Why? So why do you think we didn't do that? Was that a Radio Shack decision or a Tandy decision? It was an Intel. Intel says, We'll give you a great price on this part because nobody wants them. And we have this thing called the overdrive, which is like the Pentium overdrive. And you can make a lot of money selling Pentium overdrives. So you're going to ship a brain dead computer that make people pay to put a chip in the socket to make it what it should have been when you shipped it in the first place. And then Radio Shack went brilliant. <laughs> so this is all the audio stuff I did. I want to point out this chip right here. You can't see this. This says the word Tandy. This is a custom RAM DAC. Who remembers a RAM DAC on a video card? That was the chip that looked up the colors that trans 
translated the data you wrote into the memory, which was not the actual pixel data, it was the address of the pixel data, and the RAM DAC said, well, that data is yellow, or that data is green, or that data is purple, okay. And so we did a custom RAM DAC right here that was in the VIS, a guy named Carl Wakeland, who's now at AMD. He did this RAM DAC, and we basically invented our own video compression, like JPEG, but it was our own thing that we could do super high resolution, high speed graphics on TVs and monitors that nobody else could do. I'm not talking, so this was, this was before NVIDIA, before ATI. You had companies like Cirrus Logic and Sing Labs. Tandy blew those people out of the water with that RAM deck. And that was a really cool part. The rest of the stuff is not so cool, but that's a cool part there. I was in charge of the audio circuitry. So the sensation wasn't very sensational, so they decided to do a sensation two cost reduction. And so there's that damn thing again right there. And uh, we replaced the video with um, Cirrus Logic part, still had the RAM DAC, it goes right there. There's no audio circuitry because we had Creative Labs by then, Steve Erickson had left Tandy, and I was now dealing with my former employee and uh, we, have, we had a custom-made Creative Labs card that went in the Sensation 2. And so you can see it's a much cleaner design. But by then, that ship had sailed, the horse had left the barn, hasta la vista, baby. So here's another guy I want to talk about, a friend of David, named David Konetsky. So I hired David to do the custom video controller. So we had a custom video controller. Tandy at the time was the world's largest user of custom computer chips, ASICs. Okay, starting even in the Cocoa 2. So before Dell and HP and IBM, we were doing full custom like there's no tomorrow. So he came from the video game industry, and so I hired him specifically to do the video chip, and he did a great job, but we had a little quibble. He quit over the speaker selection in the sensation, went to Dell, he's a VP, and a Dell Fellow. I can pick him. I can pick him. Still there, isn't he? Right? Yeah. Still there. So I'm out of time, so if you want to hear about why he quit over a speaker. Now, Tandy Sensation, multimedia. You think stereo? Right? Is that singular or plural? We can talk later. Here's a random picture, David Barr. He was the industrial designer for this sensation in the Model 2000. So he designed the look of it. Why he's trying to kiss my prototype sound blaster card, I have no idea, but this is a picture I found. So he was a really good, very talented industrial designer, but he left because he invented this thing called the Buckle Buddy for Walmart. He didn't need Tandy no more. So we were really struggling. Along comes Safi. He's the A, I mean, he's the S of AST, the CEO. And he came in and he bought Tandy. And he had a meeting. And he put us all in a room. And we had tote bags and frisbees and rah, rah, rah and banners, you know, Tandy, AST. And he said the one thing that if you ever hear, and this is a Dilbert cartoon, the only thing that's going to change is the name on your paycheck you run, because what it means is it's gonna change from Tandy to AST to Texas Unemployment Commission. <laughs> so I wanna end my talk about how things ended for me personally at Tandy. And then I have some time for q and I'm sorry I'm running a little late, but I like to talk. I have the opposite of stage fright, as you can probably guess. I found my last performance review when I was at AST. All right, so this was at the end of August of 93. So the Sensation 1 had shipped, and I was almost ready to sign off on the Sensation 2 because it was for Christmas of 93, right? So here's what it says. I worked on the VIS, I worked on the audio board, which was the board that went into the Sensation 1, and you know, I was on the Sensation 2, responsible to hardware, sounds good, major accomplishments. Oh, I was the VIS, significant, technical and cost restraints, and I did the board design, but we went to Creative Labs, 
but I did all the design. Cessation one project is completion and Paul's instrumental. Oh, and this is a toss up. He just happened to go get his MSEE while he was going to night school and had a four year old. But you know, he got an MSEE. I'm thinking, that looks good. Does that look good, everybody? Yeah, that looks great. All right. Areas of strength. Analog design, digital design. Most people at Tandy could only do one. I could do two. <laughs> Multimedia audio. Who, who ever heard of the MPC specification for Microsoft? Who wrote it? Moi. Knowledge of multimedia. Well, I wrote the spec. I kind of know what I'm talking about if you write the spec. Paul is a very dedicated worker and will go the extra mile. What does extra mile mean at Tandy? That means you work, that means you work without uh, compensation over time. And in order to complete a project. So far, so good. But then they just can't stop, can they? Areas of improvement. Now, could they have left that blank? No, they can't because the United States system, when you learn grading in school, it's not a system of reward, it's a system of varying punishment. We start with the 100 and then we take points away. You don't start with the zero and we try to give you points. Like We need to give this guy as much points as he can. We're going to punish him. And your grade is how bad you were. What's left is what, how good you were, but we're going to even put in red ink everything you did wrong. Areas of improvement. Paul is knowledgeable and sometimes have a problem, sometimes, that should be always, has problems <laughs> dealing with peers who disagree with him because they're stupid. <laughs> he, I don't disagree with you, I'm just trying to explain to you why you're wrong. <laughs> He recognizes this lack of diplomacy, because I used to call people stupid, and he should work on this. And of course, in the, in the early 90s, the two most overused terms in all of HR was team building. There's no I in team. Now, this is the thing that got, Paul is also very aggressive. I piss off Bill Wilson in pursuing technical ideas and solving problems. I went, wait, I need to improve because I try to solve all the problems all the stupid people did that I had to fix because I'm the project manager and when it's behind schedule and over budget, it's all my fault. That's a problem. So I'm thinking, okay, okay, fine. At this point in my career at Tandy, I had never been promoted, ever, not one time. I've gotten raises, but I was never promoted. However, when AST bought us, this was under AST. This was not a TN review, this was an AST review. And AST had a different set of salaries and levels, and there was a job that I could have been promoted to that TN didn't even have a description of, okay? Which was super, super senior, super, super engineer, okay? And I'm like, here we go. Okay, so I'm a jerk, but I'm a very talented jerk. Let's see that promotion checkbox. Come on, baby, show it to me. Duh, no promotion checkbox. They didn't promote me. Now look at this number, 57,900. Does that look kind of arbitrary to you? Well, it should, because in order to promote me, they would have to pay me $58,000, and I'll be goddamned if I want to promote Paul Schreiber. So we're just going to take $100 off and see you later. I quit the next day. So that's my talk. Um, so I have this little quote from Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who wrote a book called 100 Years of Solitude, which no one's ever finished. It's called, Life is Not What You Live, But How You Remember It and How You Recount Your Remembers. So I hope I remembered most of this correctly and stuff like that. I do plan to write a book called Mostly True Tales. I have a Facebook group called Mostly True Tales. Please just go, it's not too hard on Facebook. You type Mostly True Tales in the search box and you'll see a picture of Tandy's old building. You can join it. It's gonna be like the book, The Soul of a New Machine about Data General, which I was there when I wrote that book. I've been everywhere. And uh, goal is next fall. So when I,
part of my reason for coming here is not just to talk, it's to talk to you guys about what I should put in the book. What do you want to see in the book? Because I'm not going to buy it. I want you guys to buy it. Okay? So that's what I had. Thanks again. And uh, I did pretty good. So it's supposed to start at 11, and I know it's 11, and so if you need to go set up or something, please, but if you have any questions, anybody? Yes, sir? Uh, so somewhere I either read on that uh, Facebook page or something about an adventure game within Tandy Towers, and I'm wondering if you're going to make that available. So we asked about the adventure game in Tandy Towers. The reason that was a controversy was the guy who wrote it actually released, uh, talked about the Model 16 in there that wasn't supposed to be a top secret. So is it a secret anymore? No. Okay, I guess we can talk about Model 16 now. Anybody else have a question or anything? Yes, sir? About the resite and CD-ROM, I mean, I recall Tandy made the big announcements that they're going to have this in the computer. Is it any way connected to the big stuff? No. No. So we asked about, was the Thor... Media, the Thor media was audio only. It was, okay, so if you in the CD-ROMs, you have what's called color books. Red book, orange book, green book, yellow book, purple book, God knows. All I know is the damn things cost $3,000 a piece, okay? And each one was for, this is CD-ROM read only, this is read write only, this is read write erasable only, this is multimedia, this is something that we never even thought about, you know, and so this was cd Red book, which is audio only, okay, so it was never designed to be in the computer. So, but we were the ones that gave everybody the idea to make one, and of course everybody else said, well, the market is not in audio CDs, it's in computer CDs, which Tandy's like, oh, what? Okay, so now the, they're ubiquitous, they're everywhere, right? But Tandy wasn't even looking that way, they were looking at audio CDs. Yes, sir. You mentioned the uh, Tandy 2000, you worked no, I didn't. Um, yes, I did. Go ahead. The uh, TV joystick interface? I deny all knowledge of that board, yes. <laughs> what about it? Yes, I designed it. Talk to us about it because it was never released. Right. It was never released because um, we spent a lot of money. So I did the high-res graphics card for the 2000. And they said, why would we have a high-res graphics card and a TV board at the same time? And the answer was, we were desperate to do anything to get the sales up because um, we didn't have Lotus 1, 2, 3 on it because our director of software told Mitch Kapoor to go take a hike. And I was in that meeting because Lotus 1, 2, 3 wrote directly to the hardware to get the speeds up, but mainly because they wanted 1, 2, 3 to look the same on every computer and every graphics board like the fonts the same, the spacing the same. And so in order to do that, they didn't want to go through the BIOS and your font ROM or whatever. They wanted to go to the hardware. And so they came and said, just give us the hardware, you know, give us the schematics and we'll sign any NDA you want. We've already signed 20 NDAs with all your competitors. Okay, we'll sign NDA and we'll have Lotus 1, 2, 3 on your computer by Christmas. And George Robertson, the VP of software said, no, that's not how it works here. And I'm like kicking George on the table going, just, 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 just give it to him. And then I kind of said, I'll give it to you, Mitch. And George is kicking me like, no, you won't. And so, uh, the, meeting, so the meeting lasted about 45 seconds. And we didn't have Lotus 1, 2, 3. That's just kind of typical of how things went. There was nothing wrong with the Model 2000 hardware per se. It was how it was presented and it was just not done properly. The video graphics card I designed could write 23 million pixels per second, which was the world's fastest graphics card. It was faster than a $3 million Evans and Sutherland. It's 23 million pixels per second. And by the time that we got through GW Basic, it was like drawing circles, like, brrr, okay, I mean, I'm like, what the hell? Anybody else have it? Yes, sir. I was just going to add to that. Okay. Hey, you buyer of 2000s. I know it's his baby, but the Model 2000, Tandy Management misjudged the importance of hardware compatibility. We thought MS-DOS compatibility was sufficient. It wasn't. Many applications were writing directly to hardware, and we didn't know that until after we launched. 
fair? Oh, we, we didn't think it was that many, but we knew like, well, let us, when the CEO and the guy who wrote the program tells you he writes the hardware, that's probably a clue you should probably start looking around and ask somebody else, you know, what do you do too? But anyway, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was gonna be a BIOS compatible because it had a really good video. I mean, there's two of them sitting over there. I mean, it has the SMC video controller that's double high, double wide, so you're scrolling. You know, it has every single VT-102 escape code in the BIOS. You can give it, I mean, that thing is a full VT-102. But everybody's like, what's a VT-102? We're just like, okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, Samsung purchased AST. Important question to a lot of us who restore and archive the software and hardware specifications. Who currently owns the IP? Samsung. Mm -hmm. Now, whether or not they care, I mean, so so Peter's asking, like, what what happens to the IP and stuff? The IP stays with the last person who buys it which is Samsung, and they're still in business as far as I checked, so they own the IP. Now, certainly Samsung can sell the IP, or but generally the whole thing about IP is you never know when you might need it, so it's kind of like all you guys with all your cables and adapters, you never know when I need this cable, okay? And so you don't give it away, and that's true with IP, because it costs nothing to store. It's on a floppy disk in, in a, a, under a mountain in Colorado somewhere. It's no skin off your nose. You just have to pay to store it every year, but you just never know when you pull it back out, and you go, it's 35 years old, and you go, you just never know. You just never know. Early days question. Okay. Um, the P box that you showed was Shoei Radio. Is that your design? No, it's the one I found on the web. The one that I designed. What did you do in 1977? Um, I designed a three transistor AM radio because we had a two transistor AM radio, but it really was terrible. And I put a, a three transistor radio together in that. I did this thing called the Decision Maker that had like two neon LEDs, and and I still have that and. Uh, that was not an original design, that was a, a redo, because that one came out like in 67 or something, and, and, uh, but they were having trouble getting the, the transformers and the neon tubes and stuff and stuff. But there was a popper. Those things were pretty popular, but they were $8, okay, which is five hours of your minimum wage salary back then. So you had to work five hours to get that crappy thing. But I used to build them, and I still have the first one I built with my wood burning set as a soldering iron. Yes, sir. I did the bucket brigade, that was me. I built it. How'd it work? It was very hard. Very hard what? It was very hard to make it work at the beginning because, uh, you know, it's a kid. Well, yeah, well, I can't help it if he can't solder, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll tell you the story behind that real quick. Okay. So a bucket brigade is how you do like a reverb or delay, okay? So it's a chip that has a bunch of MOS capacitors that it, audio comes on one side and you have a clock and they just go down this little delay line and audio comes out, okay? That's all it is. Made by a company called Reticon. But these chips were $15 a piece, normally, okay? And so when I was there, the, we had manufacturers reps, so this is a whole chart on book. We had manufacturers reps that would come, and that's what David does right now. He reps different companies and says, you need to buy these cool things we have, and we'll bring people in to help you buy these. We have cool things. Because again, there's no internet, there's no searching. So they told us what cool things are out there. So one of the reps that we, so the same rep that sold us the Pong chip from a company called General Instruments, which became Microchip, which I worked there, because I've worked everywhere and done everything said, we have this company called Reticon that makes these delay lines. And I go, well, I know about them, but they're $15. He goes, well, we have some parts that let's just say don't meet spec. And I said, well, what spec? And he goes, well, temperature. Because when bucket brigade lines get hot, the charge on the MOS gates goes down. I go, well, what, when did they stop working? Well, the spec was, was 40C, which is lower than most chips, which is 70C. They go, 30C. And I go, well, we just won't sell them to, I don't know, Arizona. How much are they? One dollar. I said, how many do you have? How many do you want? <laughs> So we bought, and, and David will tell you, the, the phrase was floor sweepings. This was not the first time nor the last time that Radio Shack sold floor sweepings. Okay, 
Polypax, no time to test these. This is what Polypax rejected, okay? So the Bucker Brigade was done because we got a dollar for that Reticon chip. Huh? For a dollar. Those chips, by the way, now, if you can find a real one that's not a Chinese knockoff, like it used to be a NAND gate, and they put said 24, they're like $70 now. Anything, anybody else? I hate to take up your display time. So if there's no more questions, you know, thanks again. I'll be here all day today.